Welcome in, everybody, to another episode of the Musketeer Report podcast. Paul Fritschner alongside Rick Broering, and this is obviously one of our favorite episodes to do every year. It's the season preview show, this time the 2023-2024 season preview of the Xavier Musketeers. Rick, it's good to be with you, and before we get into the meat of the episode, uh, you're not sitting in your usual spot, and for people that have gotten used to you sitting in a home studio, your home studio doesn't really exist right now, and why is that? Uh, tough, tough scene over here, Paul. We've been under reconstruction the last uh, six or so, so days uh, after my ceiling actually collapsed in, in the office. There's some video of this if you're watching on YouTube. Just uh, all at once, the drywall all came down, not water damage, uh, just really poorly done a long time ago with really heavy plaster on top of the drywall, and it all came tumbling down. So uh, that's what I've been doing the last week or so is uh, fixing this room. And uh, right now I'm, I'm podcasting from the, the family room here. When you told me the other day at practice, hey, Paul, uh, we're going to have to rethink some things with the podcast. I don't really have a studio right now. I said, oh, what happened? You know, you're moving your computer around, maybe getting some new equipment. He goes, no, no, it, it just collapsed. I, just nonchalant. I said, what, Rick? It collapsed? You, you pull out your phone. You show me the pictures you just showed, the videos. I go, were you in there? Are you all good? Everything all right? The dog, the wife, the kid, everybody good? Made it out safely. Everybody's doing well. So, uh, but this is what it is. We're just, we're making do with what we've got here. So my apologies. All right. Well, let's get right into it. Let's start things off. Uh, you know, it's been a busy, it's been a busy few weeks since the last time we talked. Yeah, Paul, we've got a lot of basketball to get to, uh, Xavier stuff. We've got the scrimmages. We've got the musketeer tip off event that used to be musketeer madness and will be musketeer madness again, down the line. We haven't talked since any of that yet. And we've got a few weeks of preseason practices that we've been watching. But first of all, one of the things that's been a big topic of conversation around the Xavier fan base that I wanted to, to get your opinion on since you're involved with it is your new venture with Adam Baum and Sean Miller, the head coach of Xavier. You guys are doing the Sean Miller podcast under kind of a an all encompassing media umbrella that you have formed uh, with Anthony Breen. C- can you take us behind the scenes a little bit here? Like everyone was wondering, okay, Paul is is changing jobs. He's moving on from Chatterbox Sports, but he hasn't announced what's going on yet. This was that something else. So over the last month or so, what have you kind of been doing as you've been going to practices and preparing all of this? Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I've been working with Adam Baum every day uh, since the middle of August. I was presented with this opportunity in early August, and this was obviously something that I've been working to. It kind of combined everything, like I said in that article with Shelby Dermer, who wrote that article introducing everything. I I basically, this was an opportunity that combined everything I'd really ever worked for into one spot. And when I realized how much buy-in there was from Sean, And when I was able to talk with Sean and have an initial conversation and really get his thoughts and his ideas and what he presented to us about what he wanted to do with this, right? Anthony pitched him on this idea and said, hey, look, there there are so many players and people in the media right now that have really taken control of what they want to put out there. They have their own voice. You look at players, you look at the Kelsey's Tom Brady, uh, Pat Beverly, all these players, but you really don't see coaches doing things like this a lot. And coaches have their coaches shows that everybody listens to the, the Sean Miller coaches show. We go to it every week, but you don't really have a podcast in this setting where it gives you this free form blank canvas ability to talk about whatever you want to talk about, bring on whoever you want to talk to, um, And this was something that Sean really bought into. And I think that was the most encouraging and exciting thing for me was the initial first conversation that I had with him about this. Within 15 seconds, I could tell that he was fully bought into wanting to do this, that he was excited about being able to share some of his old stories, bring on friends, coaches, former players, everything like that. And uh, from that point on, I I realized kind of, what I was getting myself into and, and and how exciting this venture could be working with Adam has been great. Um, Adam does have his day job that he works with Anthony on um, as well. And Anthony is a Xavier graduate. So everybody kind of has that tie in and that, and that buy-in. Um, but over the last couple of months, it's really been getting it off the ground, trying to get ideas, trying to think of potential guests through the way, uh, making sure we have all the equipment, you know, all the background stuff that goes into logo design uh, templates, platforms, all those things. 
Um, then finally in the last two to three weeks, getting things off the ground. And the, the biggest thing for us is being able to be around, being at practice every day has allowed us to to really interact with both Sean, the coaching staff, being there with with you and, and Shelby and the four of us sitting there every day and, and getting to really be inside what this program has done now over the last few months. And now that we've recorded a couple of shows on the Sean Miller podcast, I think it's pretty clear what, like I said, what he wants to do with this and how he wants to to go about this going forward. I think the biggest thing for people listening to this to understand is that it's not going to be like every Monday. Um, it's not going to be every Tuesday. We're not, we don't have a set date right now. It's a little easier because you're in the off season, but once the season actually gets going, it, there might be a, a Tuesday night where they travel home and it, they get in at 2 a.m. in the morning. Maybe we had a show scheduled on Wednesday, but it's coming off a, a loss and you want to just reschedule and get in a better frame of mind. Maybe you do it on Thursday. Those kinds of things are where we want to be flexible. Um, but we have a lot of guests. I'm not going to name drop any guests because we've already had some guests where we thought we were going to get people on and, and record early and then schedules didn't align. So I don't want to. I don't want to float any names out there right now and then let anybody down. Um, but what I can say with pretty strong confidence is that the guest list of who Sean wants to get on is very strong. It'll be very cool to see this develop as the season goes on. Um, I'm extremely excited to work with this. Uh, this is an opportunity where I, I don't know 100% yet, but I believe I'll be traveling to most, if not every game, to kind of get some of those interviews, things like what you saw at Media Day. Um, a lot of the coverage, like what I've done at the NCAA tournament uh, over the last couple of seasons, whether it was going on the road with Villanova a couple of years ago or, or whether it was last year with Xavier, where you're going, you're getting those interviews, kind of getting that digital media, the content, that kind of side. Um, so it is the podcast. Uh, there are more shows that will be added to that network down the line both Xavier and non-Xavier related this is a network that we are trying to build the 1831 network the rebound rundown uh will be a part of that so that'll essentially stay the same it'll be the same daily format as last year um but but really to tie a bow on the Sean Miller podcast first of all uh to Rick to you I, I want to say thanks for sharing it on the message board and to everybody that uh, gave us feedback. We, we've been reading the feedback on the message board. Um, and we appreciate it, especially the topics that people are interested in. This is obviously a work in progress, and we want to cater to all of you that are listening to this. But I think in a bigger and broader sense, and this is the last thing I'll say about it, uh, is it gives Sean the ability not just to build his own personal brand, but um, but also to really build Xavier's brand from a national perspective, right? He he can talk about his stories uh, from previous coaching experiences or players or whoever it might be, and you're tapping into an audience, whether it be at Arizona or whether it be a team that he's played, whether it's the Pac-12, like he was talking about on last week's show with, or this week's show, I guess, with John Fanta. It, it allows you to, to get into so many different audiences and really build that brand beyond just himself. And it allows him to show his personality. I think that was the biggest thing that you, one of the bigger things that you take away is from this week's show with John, I, I thought it was, you know, kind of interesting when John is talking about getting him to lighten up and Sean is sitting there saying, Oh, you know, there you go with the stereotype again, never laughs, never smiles. And you know, who would have ever thought that Sean Miller five or six years ago would be doing something like this. And now all of a sudden he is, and it's been cool to be a part of, I'm really appreciative uh, of the support. And, you know, like I said to you, Rick, for helping share it and help it grow. And and hopefully uh, as this continues to grow, people enjoy it and spread it around. And it, it is only up from here. I'm a little surprised that more coaches don't do this. And maybe you've probably done more research into this at the college level. And I have given that you just helped launch this business, but I don't, I can't think of really any prominent coaches that have a podcast that like this, where it's, like you said, it's not a coach's show where it's something where they're going into other topics, where they're kind of just talking about whatever they want, where they're having their own guests on. Um, I know there have been different things at different times where like Coach K had a show on Sirius XM. I can think of a few things out there, but not th this would seem like a home run for most coaches, given that they have to be self promoters. If you want to recruit, you have to be able to put your brand out there, promote your personality. And this seems like an awfully good opportunity to do exactly that and put out the message that you want, control the narrative 100% on your end and put that out there to recruits. I'm a little surprised that more coaches don't do this. Um, and I, I do think this is a great opportunity for Sean to kind of 
break some of the stereotypes that that he's had uh, throughout his career because it's shocking how good he is at this stuff, even though uh, we've been told his throughout his entire career that he hates doing media stuff. Yeah, and I think that's the biggest thing. Now, maybe other coaches do have the shows, and we've just missed it in research, but I can't imagine with the research that we did that there is a show like this specific to a coach out there in a podcast format. And I I think to, to, to what Sean was looking for in this was we have made this as absolutely easy as possible for Sean. He walks in after practice. Everything is set up. He has already looked at the outline maybe the day before of what we have sent him that we're going to talk about or who the guest might be on the show. He looks at it. He says, hey, fellas, that looks good. He sits down. He records. He's done. This is a, a short, condensed project for him where, you know, and, and that was my point when I came on was this is a this is a job that I have to do full time and helping build this media network. Like I said, it's there's going to be more to it as far as the network goes than just this. But for right now, this is a massive undertaking to get this off the ground because, you know, for me, not only am I recording it with Adam and then with Sean, but, you know, Adam is helping us script the episodes that I'm going in and editing all the video, running all the social media, clipping the videos, putting out the highlights, whatever it might be. So my point when I came on was this needs to be a full-time thing. This can't be something where I'm splitting my attention one place or another because the only way that Sean will agree to do this is if we make it as easily accessible for his time, especially during the season as possible. And I think a lot of coaches, Rick, they look at a coach's show and they say, oh, that checks the box, right? And a lot of coaches even don't like doing that. But the other thing too is that this gives him the opportunity to talk about whatever he wants to talk about whenever he wants to talk about it. And if there's a message that maybe he didn't get asked about in a press conference or didn't get asked about on a post game show or whatever it is, you know, I, I, this gives him an opportunity to share that. And, and that was my point when I talked to, to Byron and Joe about it. Um, I, I said to them, look guys, like this is, I, I in no way, shape or form want what we are doing to overlap with what you all are doing because we're basically generating two very different shows. Our, our goal is not to sit down with Sean and talk about the X's and O's of Monday night's Robert Morris game on Tuesday afternoon. Our goal is to talk obviously about the team at, at certain points, but to get overall coaching, leadership, guests, storylines. And then as those things happen, he'll talk about the team too, and it'll just be naturally included within the show. Yeah, very briefly here. I don't want you to have to go into too many details because I know some of this is still developing and you don't want to give everything away that you're doing. But I mean, from episode one, which is Sean kind of talking about his history in basketball and some family stuff uh, in terms of, you know, the their basketball history and all of that and his recruiting stories and all those things to the second episode was almost like season preview Big East talk with John Fanta. How varied do you think these are going to continue to be in terms of subject matter do you think it'll continue to jump around and be like a completely different show every week or do you think once the season gets going we're going to settle into more okay we'll kind of see what the the topic is of the season for sean to talk about here but it's going to be more of like a rhythm i i think it will vary i can say we're recording this on halloween night on tuesday we're going to record episode three on wednesday night uh tomorrow night on november 1st and i can tell you that if we end up pulling off what we pull off for tomorrow night's episode, I don't want to spoil it because it will be pretty cool. But if we pull it off, it will be completely different than the first two episodes. It, um, it, it'll be a, a totally different type of deal. It, it'll again, actually, tomorrow night's episode will be much more visual. Um, I, it'll still be published on all the podcast platforms, but uh, it'll mainly be tailored toward YouTube. And it was an idea that Sean came to us after practice the other day. And he said, hey, Paul, Adam, can you guys make this happen? I want to do this on Wednesday afternoon. And we said, sure. And then that's an opportunity for us to, to do that. And then maybe we record episode four immediately after. And, you know, that that's that's where talking about the games necessarily might not come into play as much. Because let's say tomorrow night we record episodes three and four. Episode three could look entirely different than episode four. But when you save them to publish two weeks out, Episode four, which we record tomorrow night, might not get published for 14 days, which would be leading into the second week of the season before the Purdue game. So 
the, those are, and, and who knows he might not have the time tomorrow night and that's that's our flexibility and that goes back again to me doing this full time where he might say like like the Fanta episode for instance we recorded episode one the day before and as we finished recording we thought we were going to record episode two and he said actually you know what fellas Fanta's in tomorrow why don't we all just sit down and do episode two tomorrow night and we said well you know sure let's do it that'd be a lot of fun and it worked out great so to answer your question I think as we get into the cadence and the rhythm of the season you'll be able to experience more, maybe more rhythm. But as guests come on or as other people come in, uh, I think it will vary. And I think it'll be, but I think the way that it varies will be very cool for people to watch and and to listen to. All right. Well, that was 15 minutes on the uh, Sean Miller podcast. So let's talk (laughs) some hoops. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Musketeer tip off has happened since the last time we talked. Uh, Rick, between Musketeer tip-off, the Notre Dame scrimmage, which everybody has heard about, and the Kent State scrimmage, which I don't even know if you have heard about, what can we take away from all three of those? It, that that's a, that's a good question. I think um, <laughs> go. <laughs> the, the biggest thing that would stand out, I think, is the, the way that the offense has still put up points. I think that's the number one thing that jumped out to me. Now you can. You could talk about the fact that they they lost to a Notre Dame team that's supposed to be really po- bad, and and that obviously will jump out at a lot of people. I don't care too much about exhibition scores, especially based on last year when we saw them get smacked around by Vanderbilt. I, I am more interested in the fact that they are putting up 84 points um, in a game where they're turning the ball over nearly 20 times and uh, not getting a lot of three-point shooting outside of uh, uh, Trey Green. And I think that is that's what really stands out is just they're playing at a really fast pace again this year. And it seems like they're not having much trouble generating offense, despite all the guys that they lost, all the new pieces, all the moving parts coming into this season. I think that's like the number one sort of from the positive side, the biggest takeaway I've had. There are certainly a lot of personnel things that we can go into. And then there are some more negative things that I think we can talk about. Number one being the fact that they scored 84 points against Notre Dame in a secret scrimmage and somehow lost the scrimmage yeah. to another team that's another Dame team that's not supposed to be very good. So if you're expecting this defense to be a lot better, uh, I'm not saying it won't, but that score certainly wouldn't indicate that it's uh, it's up to speed just yet. Um, I think that that's probably on the, on the negative side of things. It would probably be the fact that there's there's not a lot of three point shooting right now, and the fact that Quincy Oliveri hasn't been making them making shots in these live action segments whether it be the blue white game or the the close scrimmages gives you a little bit of concern about how will this team get it done from the perimeter early on in the season and also the defense i mean it just really hasn't been too impressive when i think a lot of people are coming into this year thinking okay last year the defense struggled a lot but the offense was really good this year they'll probably rely a bit more on the defensive side so far, and again, it's very, very limited sample size we're talking about, and a lot of it we haven't even seen with our own eyes. It doesn't seem like the defense has been as good as you might think. Yeah, I would agree. And when you think back to last year's team, you think about a team that a lot of times could go out and just outscore other teams. This team is very talented offensively, but I don't think they're going to be able to rely on just being able to outscore some of these top teams the way they did last year, if they can at least get something out of the defensive side of the ball. And right now it it has been very much a work in progress. A lot of it to me has been about communication. I feel like that's something that we've heard the staff talk a lot about is just trying to get these guys to communicate, to adjust defensively, to rotate, to do all those little things that a new group that hasn't played together might not recognize and might not, uh, necessarily do at the peak ability yet. Yeah, well, I think when you talk about any college basketball team, early in the season, communication is going to be a big key. None of them talk enough, especially defensively. When you're talking about a team that brought in 10 new players, three of them have a legitimate language barrier to deal with. They're from other countries, and there's a they speak English to varying degrees, certainly. But, I mean, that there is legit communication issues that I think this team has had to get through. And it probably slowed their progress, especially early. I felt like the first two weeks of preseason practices, there was a a different pace to it all than there has been the last week or so as they've started to catch on to more things. And I think the communication 
and uh, the the language that they're speaking now, the language of basketball, they've all kind of gotten on the same page with, it seems. And I, I think that has sped up their development over the last however many days, you know, 14 maybe call it. But uh, prior to that, I do think that was that was an even bigger concern than it is now as we get closer to the start of the season. When you think back to Musketeer tip-off and Quincy Oliveri not exactly having the best night, how much stock do you put in his poor shooting performances over the first couple of weeks of inner squad slash exhibition play? Yeah, and I mean, you go from the blue-white game, which obviously he shot a ton of shots, didn't make many of them, uh, to the Notre Dame scrimmage, which we know he really didn't shoot a lot of shots at all. And we don't know what the numbers were in the Kent State scrimmage, but I was told that he didn't perform very well in that game either. I wouldn't be too worried yet about Quincy Oliveri or anything like that. He's a big-time shooter. He made a ton of threes at Rice, set the school's all-time record for three-pointers made. And throughout a lot of preseason practice, he's been one of the leading scorers in practices and live action segments when they've had inner squad scrimmages at different times, he has put up points. He's made shots. So it's not so much for me about Quincy Oliveri right now and him not getting it done or whether you should be concerned, but for him personally, I think he would have to be worried about Trey green because as he's not making shots in some of these segments in these opportunities, Trey green is Trey green is yep. balling out at every opportunity. And from everything I know about Trey Green, everything I saw from him at the preps level, he's not the type of guy that's going to back down when the lights are on and we're playing real games. Like that's going to bring out the best in him. So if it doesn't bring out the best in Quincy Oliveri right away, I would be a little bit concerned that he may lose some of his role and potentially even uh, what I had him as a lock to start probably two weeks ago. And I still think he is probably your starter at the shooting guard position. But each day that goes by, I think it's more and more of a conversation of, how many minutes is Trey Green going to play? And at some point, is he going to be so good that you have to put him in the starting rotation? Now, these are all preseason thoughts. Okay. Like, we're not, let's not go overboard here. We last year around this time, Kiki Tandy was in the starting lineup. Now, I, I questioned that personally. I, I didn't think that was necessarily going to last, but you never know for sure this time of year. So uh, let's not get too carried away. Maybe we'll get three games into this thing. And it'll be like, you know, Trey Green at 5'10 or smaller, whatever he is, that size is really making a difference. But so far to this point, what we've seen in preseason practices, what we saw in the blue-white scrimmage, and what we've seen from the numbers in the close scrimmages, Trey Green is, is not having any difficulty with size at this level. Kiki's not even around anymore. He's still catching strays. No, I totally agree with you. I, I, I totally agree with you on the Trey Green thing. I, I, I think watching him day in and day out, you said you, you, wrote, a, you wrote it in your post – I mentioned it on the Sean Miller podcast the other day. It feels like when the four of us sit there and we watch practice, you can count how many times we'll all look at each other and say, whoa, Trey just did that. Whether it's a crossover, jab step, step back three, you know, something, clearing space, whatever it is, that there are four or five eye-popping moments every practice from him where you think to yourself, okay, he's a defensive liability without a doubt, just due to his size. and his, it Naturally, he's going to be – an undersized defensive player, but on the offensive side of the ball, he has been a, a real force and somebody to your point that I think may force his way into that potentially starting lineup sooner rather than later. Yeah. I mean, the, like you're, like you're, you're going to come to a point where you can't not play him a significant amount of minutes the way yeah, he's playing probably. right now. You can do all the coach speak you want and talk about experience, upperclassmen, leadership, all these other throw out all the buzz terms and cliches you want. At the end of the day, if you're in the fourth floor of the Centos Center right now and you're on that coaching staff, you have to be having real thoughts about do we just have to start this kid as a freshman, even though he's tiny and even though he has no experience? Like he's just that impressive on a daily basis to where it's like the how many minutes is Trey Green going to be playing? That has to be a real conversation that's going on in, in the coaches' offices, I would think. Um, and, and if it's not, it's probably because they already know. Like, he's going to be playing a ton. Because <laughs> yeah. he's been impressive so far from our vantage point. How much do you think his lack of size affects his playing time or his ability to get uh, – right away, I mean. Like, obviously, he's always going to be limited by that, but right away. 
I mean, that was my biggest concern coming in because we've seen these guys before where they are dynamos and they score 35 a game in the UIBL or whatever. And Traeger didn't quite do that, but he was one of the, he was definitely the best shooter, I think, in the country at, at the prep school level. And then they get to college and it's like, well, you know, 5'8, 5'9, 5'10. It's just different in college when point guards are sometimes 6'4 or 6'5. You know, sometimes point guards look like Desmond Claude. And especially in the Big East, when you look at some of the point guards you're going to be going against this year, there are some big physical guys. And so that was my biggest concern is how much is that going to impact him? Can he still do the same things? And to this point, I mean, he looks almost like the exact same player. There's really nothing that's been limited because he's so quick. He has such a great feel and pace to him. Uh, he can shoot from the outside. He has the athleticism to get to the rim and finish, even despite his lack of size. Yeah, I mean, he's just, he's just been really good, Paul. And and that was my biggest concern was how much would the size impact him. But to this point, I, I don't really see it being a big problem, especially on the offensive end. Defensively, like you said, it's always going to be an issue to some extent. But he's very competitive, too. So it's really not as big of a problem as you might think. So we talked a little bit about the starting lineup. What would your starting lineup be right now? And has I, has that has that changed since practice started? It has changed for me, definitely. Um, right now, I would be going with Davion McKnight at the point guard. I, I would still go Quincy Oliveri at the shooting guard position, but again, I mean Trey Green could be playing the starter minutes coming off the bench, in my opinion. Uh, but my guess is Quincy will still get that starting opportunity because he has so much experience mm. here, and this is his only his only year at Xavier. Um, then at the three, it's going to be Desmond Claude for me. And at the four, this is where I've changed my mind uh, over the last few weeks. And especially when we've seen the blue white scrimmage and the numbers from the Notre Dame scrimmage, where he played the third most minutes on the team. Lazar Djokovic is going to be my starter at the forward spot, the freshman, uh, which may be a little bit of a surprise. A few weeks ago, I would have definitely said Gitas Namiksha, but it, the freshman has more upside and more talent. And I don't think the gap between what they're giving you right now in terms of a, a consistency basis is that different. And I think Lazar has kind of played his way into that starter role. And then at the five position, I think it's Abu Usman. So the North Texas transfer, he's kind of been the, the expected starter from day one since he arrived here. And I don't think we've seen anything that would change that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I would probably go with the same starting five. If it was me personally, the way they're playing right now, I'd have a hard time not starting Trey the way he is playing right now. But with that experience, the the being brought in, like you said, all that reasoning, it, it's probably going to be Quincy. Um, and I think Gita's not getting that nod at the four is something that has developed over the last two or three weeks because – when we're sitting there two and a half, three weeks ago, probably around that week of the, the blue-white scrimmage, you're sitting there thinking to yourself, this could be a, a program-changing type player, and or at least that's what we're being told, that's what we've heard, and we just really hadn't seen him a whole lot, at least at that point. Well, I think, very... I think the message at that time was more, he looks like the best player, one of the best players on the team. Like It was always Desmond Claude was kind of the best player. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I think that I don't know that it was so much that he was like going to be program changing as it was that he could be one of the best players on this team after the first week or two of practice, I think, is what we were hearing a lot of. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I, I don't know that it's necessarily changed, I guess. It just feels like it's evolved. I, it's really hard to get a read on what this coaching staff thinks of him because it feels like one day. I, I don't know. What's your, what's your read on it? Here's my thought. And you tell me if you think this is inaccurate my thought was because of his motor and i think kashi enze the freshman is in the same boat because they play hard consistently and uh in kashi's case he has the athleticism to go with it he just doesn't quite have that but they just bring it they're hard-nosed they're tough and every possession they're solid early on as other guys were thinking more trying to figure out the system trying to get settled in those guys stood out because it was just like every possession. They seemed like they were around the play. They were around the action. They were getting the loose ball. They were grabbing the rebound. They were finishing tough inside, drawing a foul. Now, as the other guys have started to figure it out. And when we say other guys, we're talking, I mean, quite honestly, at those two positions, we're talking about Lazar Djokovic and Sasha Siani probably are the two yeah. main guys here. Both of them are freshmen. Both of them are international guys. I think at first they were much more inconsistent because they just really didn't know what they were doing at all. And because of that, it made Gitas and Kashi 
look more impressive. Now, as those two guys, they have a little bit more higher upside, a little bit more talented, as they've started to figure it out and they're more comfortable, there's not as much thinking going on. They're playing faster. They're making more plays on a consistent basis. And that's where you start doing the math of like, okay, yeah, Gitas, I can count on him every play, but man, Lazar, I can count on him about 85% of the time now. And when he does make a play, it's it's more impressive. He can go make more plays on his own because of his upside and it's the tools that he has to work with. I think those things are starting to factor in a little bit with he and Sasha Siani. And that's why maybe you've seen both of them kind of rise up a little bit in the depth chart. I'm really interested to see how Lazar translates and adjusts to the division one college game. I, I just, I, I think, um, I don't want to say he's in for a rude awakening, but I think that there are elements sometimes when I watch him where I think to myself that Purdue game or that Houston game are going to be very eye-opening experiences for him. And I'm very, uh, very interested to see how his like tenacity grows as he, as they get closer toward conference play. When you think about these big time games, these all American type players that they're going to play against and then the Crosstown shootout, which for better or for worse, he doesn't really know any different because he's never even heard of, you know, anything going on with the Crosstown shootout before he shows up two months ago. So from that perspective, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it, it just, it is what it is. I'm just very interested to see kind of like emotionally how he evolves as this season kind of gets going. Well, and the physicality is just the biggest thing for me. I mean, he yeah. has all the physical tools, the length, the athleticism. Uh, he's like the tallest player on the team at at six ten ish. Uh, I am just curious when he's getting pushed around and guys are being physical in a different way than they are in other parts. You know, like you see b- basketball played in different ways, and we talk about physicality, but there's just different subtleties that I think to the American game that maybe you don't see in Europe as much. Um, and and all different parts of Europe can be different as well. But uh, that's what I'm most interested to see is like, how does he handle the Big East physicality inside when when guys are pushed on him? Because he's not super thin at this point, but uh, he's leaner, I would say. And yeah. I think that would I, I don't think he's the strongest guy or necessarily the toughest guy just yet inside. So I think that's where teams will probably try to test him more when he goes down low. But he also is, is a player with enough skill that he can kind of take outside and play on the perimeter and make some shots out there. So he's got a ton to work with, and I think he's going to be a really good player. But I'm with you in that I I do want to see how some of it translates because he's getting so much hype from the national guys that come in. You had Rothstein come in. You had Fanta come in. I'm sure Goodman's probably said something or will say something about him too. They all are gravitating towards him and and hyping him up. And uh, to me, I think I would be hyping up Trey Green a little bit more and being like Lazar has the long-term upside for certain – and maybe he'll be able to produce right away, but I think we need to see it a little bit more from him. Yeah, I fully agree. Fully agree. Uh, anything else on the starting lineup or anything else on on any of that? No, I think, I mean, if you want to go a little bit deeper into the rotation, I think we kind of hit on one of the other developing stories, which is that backup center spot. It's like, you know, yeah. Kachienze, I thought was right there, maybe in the conversation to start uh, a few weeks ago. And then now it's kind of looking more like Sasha Siani is maybe the backup to Abu Usman, especially if you look at the, the minutes from the Notre Dame game where he was the second center after Abu and got some decent run, had 10 points in that scrimmage. So I, I am interested to see how Sasha develops over the course of this year. Will they be able to find real minutes for him and get him real experience this season while, while still trying to win these games? Because if so, uh, the prospects for him long-term get really interesting. He's a, he's a guy that, like, we talk about Lazar Djokovic. I have no doubt he's going to be good down the road. I'm not sure how good he'll be this year. With Sasha, I'd still say it's up in the air overall. Like, I'm, I'm not sure that he's going to be a great Division One high major player just yet. But if he's able to get on the court this year and make an impact right away, then I think that really says something about him long term because it, he's just going to continue to get better. Just as a side note, one of the funniest moments from the preseason so far uh, was at a practice or at a what was it probably two or three weeks ago now like time it all kind of runs together but there was a ball that was just sitting on the front of the rim it was starting to roll and Sasha just went up and grabbed it and it was a very obvious goaltending and everybody kind of started to laugh and he looked around as if to say wait, wait, wait hold on hold on what I do wrong here what, what's going on and then we all realized oh wait no you, you can't do that over here Sasha and had to blow the whistle and kind of explain things and it has been 
kind of interesting watching that, you know, the, the three seconds. And you heard Sean say one time, hey, you know, David, make sure he knows that that was a three second, you know, violation, whatever it might be. But uh, yeah, that, just just a fun little kind of behind the curtain there on some of these things where these guys really are trying to get acclimated to everything that needs to happen here. Yeah, and the FIBA rules, they don't have basket interference. You can just play it right there. Ball's live yep. on the rim. And uh, oh, yeah, he went and just that. Yeah. swiped the ball off the, the rim. And yeah. uh, as the coaches, I think at, at, for a second there, you're about to like light him up for making such a silly mistake. And then you think about it for one second, you go, oh, that's actually an honest mistake in this case. Yeah, let, let's explain to him that the, the rule is different over here. Make sure he understands that. So there have been some uh, moments that have come up like that where it's like just a genuine, oh, yeah, I never even thought that we had to explain that to him. But he, yeah. how would he know? You know, but but to their credit, they've learned very fast and they've picked things up. I don't think the language barrier is as drastic as a lot of people might just assume that it is um, like they speak English and they understand concepts like Sean does not speak any slower at practice to them than he does to the rest of the team. He he explains everything in his normal cadence and his normal speed like he does to everybody else. And maybe an assistant coach might need to pull them aside and, and give a little reinforcement. But it's not like practice is any different because he has to talk to three different members of the team in a different way than he talked to the rest of the team. Yeah, he has not gone out and learned three new languages in his spare time <laughs> to uh, speak to them differently. But, I mean, you do bring up a, a good point because there are moments during practice where he's going on for four or five minutes and he's getting into all these little details and he's just firing them off one after one. And sometimes he's talking directly to, like, you know, Sasha, when this happens, it's got to be this, this, that, and you got to do this. And it's a lot of things. It's like, I speak English. I, for the most part, know what they're doing. And even I'm thinking, I don't know if I would catch all that and remember. And it's like, you're thinking, do, does he have any idea what Sean is saying right now? And it seems like for the most part, they do. Because you're right. They they seem to be picking it up pretty well. Yep. So what are the mo some of the most notable takeaways for you, Rick, uh, throughout this preseason and practice and everything? There have been, just by the way, 26 practices down as we record this. Four to go. You can't get any of those back. Only four left before the season starts. I think for the most part, we've gone over the yeah. the stuff that stood out in terms of like personnel. Uh, it, as, as overall stuff from a team perspective, I think I'm always concerned about shooting. And I think that's a concern again with this year's team. But some of the guys that I have pegged to not be great shooters uh, Desmond Claude, for instance, Davion McKnight. I would have those. I had those guys kind of pegged as non-shooters coming into the year, and that's probably still where they should be. But in my opinion, from what I've seen, they've shot the belt ball better than I would have expected coming into preseason practices. So maybe that's a sign of things to come. Maybe they'll get a little more production from those two than expected. Then hopefully Quincy and Trey Green. And uh, maybe some of the front core guys like Lazar and, and Gidas a little bit too can help provide a little bit of shooting there. And you get enough three-point shooting. But from what we've seen, even without that, they're able to manufacture plenty of points. They're they're getting a lot out of Desmond Claude from the offense, getting downhill and making plays. And it seems like they're getting to the free throw line a ton again, which I think is going to be a major strength of this year's team. When you look at the transfers and you look at their Ken Palm numbers and their foul rates, and how often they were getting to the free throw line, all of the transfers would have been like at the top of Xavier's roster last year. And that includes with Sule Boom on last year's roster. Think about how often he got fouled. These three guys are right there in terms of their numbers from last season. So I think they'll bring that to this year's team. And Desmond Claude is that same type of player who is going to get you into foul trouble a lot, be, be aggressive driving the basketball. Uh, those are kind of the two things that I would say are really standing out to me after watching several weeks of practice. I don't know how many free throws they're going to make per game. I don't know what percentage they're going to shoot, but Xavier games are going to take two and a half hours this year, the way they get to the line. I mean, the way this offense is designed and the way this team plays and how physical they are, it's going to be a long time every time they go out. You are going to get your money's worth every time you show up to CentOS, I'll tell you that. Yeah, and I think I was talking to someone about the style of offense, and you know, it's like Gonzaga has been running this same style essentially for years now. And when uh, Tommy Lloyd got the Arizona job, was Mark Few's top assistant at Gonzaga. When he got the Arizona job after Sean left, he took this same style to Arizona now. So it's kind of ironic that Sean is playing it at Xavier, Arizona's playing it, and Gonzaga is playing it. 
there are a few other teams that'll play it the same way. I mean, ball screen continuity motion offense is like everyone plays it for the most part, but you have teams that play at the fastest pace in the country running this offense. And you have teams that play at like the slowest pace in the country running this offense. And there's all different uh, details that they're, they're doing differently. Um, but th- the specific style is Gonzaga, Arizona, Xavier is all very similar. And I was just talking to, to someone about the offense and how it works this past week. And we were talking about how it just really wears on other teams. And it's almost like, yeah, you need players that that can get things done and make plays for you. But in some ways, just the fact that you're running hard and you're focused on the right things at all times puts a lot of pressure on the defense because they get in foul trouble early and they have to run the floor constantly. And they're constantly playing transition defense. And if you think about those three things, like, if a team is in foul trouble, it forces them to play differently. They might not be able to leave a big man on the floor as many minutes as they wanted to. They might have to go into the rotation deeper than they wanted to. If you keep them running all game and they're not used to it, they're, they might not be as well conditioned as you are. They might be a little bit more winded. And if you are constantly putting them in transition defense, well, there isn't a team in the country that's good at transition defense. That's just like where everyone screws up is because – they're in transition too often so if you can do that and be really good at it consistently it just wears on you over the course of a game and i think that's what you've seen xavier do really well going back to last year and i think you're going to see it again with this team even though they might not be as skilled or as high iq as last year's team was at times i think they're still going to be able to put up points because of the style of offense that sean miller has brought and just the cumulative effect that it has on teams over the course of a game all right, before we get into doing the win-loss of every game, which is everybody – you know, one of these years we should actually go back on the last show of the season and actually go back and, and think about how we did. I don't know if we've ever – I usually that. do. I, I, did, I think I did that do last we? year. I almost, I almost always go back and check our records, and then I talk about it on, like, one of the last shows and, and oh, talk do about we? how oh. the team did expectations, yeah. Oh, I'm just an idiot then, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, you can pencil that in, whatever. Uh Biggest, biggest strength, biggest weakness of this team before we get going. I think biggest strength is what we just talked about. Getting to the free throw line. Yep. I think that is going Phys- to be physicality. A, yeah. Toughness, uh, downhill driving and, and attacking the, the paint and getting to the free throw line. I think is just going to be a constant for this year's team. And it's going to, it's going to be what wins them more games than not. Physicality. Yeah. That was my answer. So close enough. All right. Biggest weakness. I'm trying to think. I I almost right. always say three point shooting. I feel like I say it every year, so I don't want to say three point shooting here. Um, is it is uh, it just the lack of continuity and knowns coming in? Like, you well, would just I would like to have more sure things. I feel like the, the 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 answer, the right answer, is a lack of experience and continuity. But we've talked so much about that. I was trying to think of something outside the box that I could answer with, um, like. But it's just it, it's just going to be such a glaring weakness in the beginning. I, it would not surprise me, even though Robert Morris is coming into this season what three hundred and sixth on Ken Palm. I mean, they're they're not good. They're not a good basketball team. Three hundred seven. I was close. One off. It would not surprise me if that was a six or seven point game at halftime, and everybody's going, well, "Uh oh." Well, let me ask you this: Is top end talent a concern? And I don't mean this in the same way that I have in years past where I've said like, oh, Xavier doesn't have a go-to guy or a clear closer. I I talked about that in past years. And obviously last year, Sule Boom developed into that for them. Uh, This year, Desmond Claude, I think, is that guy. I don't think they really have to worry about who their go-to star is or who the late game situation guy is. But when you look at this team and you think about, okay, Desmond Claude is really talented and, and hopefully be really good. But some of the other guys that were just brought in, I mean, they're all Conference USA type guys. So is yep. Sule Boom. But at some point, if you keep stacking your roster with mid-major talents, you've added some international guys and some other freshmen that are a little unknown. Kashienze, a guy that people didn't know much about coming in. Is there some concern that maybe your overall talent just isn't where it needs to be this year? Like, is that maybe a weakness? I would say it's a massive weakness, especially when you look around the rest of the Big East, and we'll talk about that more as we get into the schedule. But when you look at the Big East and what this conference is bringing back and the fact that this could be the best iteration of the Big East since realignment, maybe, the fact that you're looking at a bunch of players that now all of a sudden have to go and and figure this out without those stars, without a a whole cast of characters and a, a whole lot of stars, at least 
not going into the season. Maybe they develop into that. Look at Sule Boom last year. We would have never said that going into last season. We knew he was talented, but we would have never sat here in the preseason broadcast and said that he was going to have the season that he had. And sure enough, that's what he went out there and did. But having a collection. But think about the, of, Think about this for one ahead. second. If if you have a breakout player like that this year, or if you think about like Desmond Claude, is, we expect to be really good. Let's just assume that he's going yeah. to be a star. If you're going to have another breakout player this year, or two of them, who is it likely to be? I mean, you probably go to freshman, right? Yeah, if it's two, it's Trey and Lazar, right? So that and that's where that's where I start getting a little concerned. Is it's like if you're looking for your star power to come from freshman. That can be concerning. Now, maybe those guys are really those dudes, and it's quite possible they are. I'm high on both of them, but just trying to almost do the devil's advocate thing or or pick nits here, that would be maybe where I where I go. Is like, is there some concern that it's just like the overall level of talent? Even in practice, these guys look really good, but maybe it's just because there aren't enough dudes in practice. Yeah, I agree. I very much agree. All right, you want to get into the schedule? Let's do it. All right, let's pull up that bad boy. You got the the Kempom up. All right, how do we want to keep track of this here? Let me make a... All right. Uh, Are you going to track it? Yeah, let me let me go down the list here. So we'll pencil in uh, Robert Morris in Jacksonville. Correct. And Robert Morris. I actually think this team's going to have a really good non-conference. Jacksonville. Uh, let's see, Purdue, we both have a loss. Correct. Okay. Uh, Washington. How are we doing against Washington? I'll go win. I'm going win against Washington. Loss in the second game against whoever they play. Okay. Um, that would be St. Mary's or San Diego State. Right? Yeah, that's the other yes. side of the bracket. Yes. St. Mary's, SDSU. Uh, I will... Man, that's tough coming back two games like that. Uh, yeah, so that would put him at three and two. Yeah, I could. All right, three and two. I'll go with you on that. Three and two through those games, through that stretch. I'll say a loss out there as well. Bryant and Oakland both wins. Uh, Oakland, let's go WW. Then we have Houston. Does Xavier get it done against Houston at home? I'm going to say no on this one. I'm going to say this I, is a law. Houston is going to be extremely physical. I think this can be a tough game. I also will go with a loss on that. Okay, we have not differed yet. Delaware, that's a W at home. Xavier's going to go uh, through their guarantee games without a loss, I would assume. I don't think we have ever picked a guarantee game as a loss on this show. Trend's not stopping now. Does Xavier win the shootout at the Cintas Center on December 9th? Count it. Yes, sir. Yeah, count it. Uh, I I think that this game, I don't think this will be a blowout. Um, a lot of that will probably depend on on the final waiver decisions for Aziz and Jamil. Because if both of them get approved, especially Aziz, and you're looking at somebody who might be able to make some noise against Xavier's front court, then maybe they, yeah. But still, going to Cintas, Sean Miller and his crew, I, it just, it's, you, you just can't pick against them. If a Z Spandego plays, I do think Cincinnati is a bit different of a team and, and makes that matchup different for Xavier because that's where I think Xavier has some question marks too is in their front court. So if it's UC's front court from last year, running it back with a worse back, well, uh, UC's front court from last year, running it back with a worse back court, then I feel pretty good about Xavier's chances. If they improve their front court, maybe they have a better chance, but I'll still lean Xavier. Rick, we are forgetting one massive factor here. Seamus Lukosius, the Xavier killer. Yes, I, I just, I'm not, I'm not enamored with him. Like, he, I think he might be there. I'm best not player. either. I'm just saying he always beats Xavier. I'm not enamored with him. Just it's saying fair. he always wins. You can't look fact or fiction stats. You can't ignore well, it. Can we also admit that the Butler Xavier dynamic over the past however many years has been very strange? bizarre yeah i just think leaving the butler jersey behind will maybe change that whole dynamic well, yeah i just putting it out i'm just i'm just floating it That's out fair. it's fair right. it's fair it's a legit point uh winthrop that's a w win 
Yes. Uh, okay. All right. Let's get in the wait. Let, let me recap the uh, non-conference sets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and three in the non-conference. We did not disagree on any game. Houston eight and three with a chance to go nine and two. I think if you win that other neutral site game, I agree. Which I think is you know what I I will say. It would not shock me if they messed around and won that Houston game. That's I, like, possible. I mean, maybe they, ten one, maybe ten and one's in play. If they won the Purdue game, I'd be like on the floor. Uh, that would be that. That'd be shocking. That's, that would be that would, that would on the road for this group. Would that be before we before we move on to the conference schedule? Would would Xavier winning in West Lafayette? Where would that rank on like recent memory non conference wins? Just going into the season with the expectation that we have of the learning curve that this group has, having not played in front of a big crowd before. No, well, like obviously there are experienced players that have played in front of crowds, but I mean together at the Cintas Center right. with six new first year players several of which will probably get significant minutes. I, I'm just preparing everybody listening to this, that if it is a two or three possession game on Monday night against Robert Morris, who is by far the worst team on Xavier's schedule, don't sit there and, and be all that surprised. Uh, Xavier will win the game. I'm just saying it may take a learning curve for this team to figure out what's going on here. And if that team three three games into the season on Monday, November 13th, two weeks from last night, figures this out and wins that game, that would be one of the most monumental upsets I can remember this program pulling off in a non-conference. I, this is where you need like Dan on the podcast. This is why Dan was always so good on the podcast because he had that fan brain to quickly recall like, oh no, this was the best win in recent memory. They don't stick with yeah. me like that enough. I don't, I don't have yeah. that recall of them of like, oh, here's the top three wins off the top of my head. I, I don't have a good answer for what would be a, a bigger recent win, a more surprising recent win for Xavier. But it w- this one would be ridiculously big. But aside from that game, I don't see another one here in the non-conference schedule that I marked down as a, oh, that's that's almost certainly a loss. Like even that Houston home game. Yeah, it's tough. Yes, Houston's got a style, but they lost a lot from last year. They're going to be a new team figuring some things out and they have to go on the road to play in a really tough environment at Xavier themselves. So it's quite possible Xavier could find a way to pull off that upset. They get that second neutral site win in their exempt event in Vegas. They go two and zero there. And now all of a sudden you're looking at a one loss non-conference slate for a team that had so many question marks coming into the year. I don't think this is like a crazy idea that they could be 10 and one. I don't either. I think eight and three is probably more realistic, but I don't yes. think 10 and one is out of the question. I think nine and two is very realistic. Uh, now, do I think they beat Houston? No, I don't. I think it's, I, you may have just mentioned this. I was going back and looking at the schedule, um, but it, that Houston game to me, that kind of feels like the Indiana game from last year. Did you just say that? No. Okay. Uh, uh it kind of kind of sort of feels like the Indiana game where you have some unknowns on the team and you get a test against a team that maybe you can beat but it's coming to your place and if you win it's a big statement win but i don't know how many people are necessarily expecting you to for sure walk away with a win from that game like i'm not going to sit here and be overly shocked on the night of december 1st if we're talking about a Xavier win over Houston, I think it would be very surprising, but I wouldn't be shocked in a home game. No, not at all. That, that, that's my point. Exactly. I mean, t- saying that they could be 10 and one, isn't some crazy pie in the sky, blue colored glasses fan theory. It's it's I mean, you could see it happening fairly legitimately. And um, for this team to end up in that type of situation, it, it, it would be really impressive. And it makes me feel like this, the schedule sets up pretty well for them in terms of the non-conference stretch. Okay, so what is more realistic to you in the non-conference? Uh, nine and two or seven and four? Seven and four would I, that would be losing yeah. one of one of the Washington or Cincinnati games. You know what? Probably seven and four. Yeah, 
probably six, seven yeah. and four. But I think either are fairly likely. Yeah. But then it, as you get into conference play, that's where you have to start thinking about stacking up wins for an NCAA tournament resume too. You got to get something I'll, here. You get, you got to get a couple. I'll just say that I'm not impressed with Washington or Cincinnati at all coming into the season. So yeah. that's part of where I, I come from on that. Yeah. All right. Let's get into conference play. Uh, it starts at St. John's on the road. That is at Karnaseka. I think that's one of only two games that St. John's plays at Karnaseka this coming season. Um, and it's because Baylor and Duke play at MSG that night. I think, uh, is that a win or a loss in Rick Pitino's big East debut, uh, back at St. John's? I'm going to say that's a win. I agree. I think Saber wins that game. Uh, we still have not deferred yet. Uh, Seton Hall at home. I'm going to say that is also a win. I think Seton Hall is not good. I'm marking that as a win. Villanova on the road. Do they do it two years in a row? Loss. This is going to be very boring for everybody if we pick <laughs> the same way every game. But, I mean, hey, I, I have the schedule here, and we've we've picked these games, so so it goes. And we didn't do it ahead of time, so it is what it is. Uh, UConn, defending national champions at the Cintas on December 10th. I should point out here, between December 23rd and January 10th, Xavier only plays one game. There's a 10-day break from December 23rd to January 3rd. There's only one Big East game in that stretch. I forget who it is. I think it might be Marquette. Um, there's only one game in that stretch. Otherwise, it's a 10-day layoff for the conference. And then they only play one game there. They have an immediate bye week, Wednesday to Wednesday, between Villanova and UConn. So that's a pretty decent amount of time off where, oh, by the way, it's over Christmas break, so you have some time without classes to figure things out. Yeah, it do doesn't work you, out you too poorly home. for me either. Yeah, that's true. UConn at home. Uh, loss. All right, let's keep it moving. Loss for me too. <laughs> Providence uh, at the puddle. I'm going to say at the puddle. I'm going to say a win here. What is Providence going to be this year? Everybody's super high on them. I don't know if I'm buying it. Um, we'll I'm know by this point. I'm not, I'm not buying it. And even if they are a decent team, I feel like this is one of those games where, you know, you're, you're Sean Miller type wins. It's like that you just lost at Villanova and at home against UConn. You're not going to lose three in a row here. And Sean Miller isn't going to lose to Kim English. And you're just going to find a way. Like last year, Xavier swept UConn, right? And they probably shouldn't have done that. Uh, maybe Providence will be good and Xavier shouldn't beat them on the road, but I feel like this is just a game where they'll find a way to win. Yep. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm with you there. I I, I don't – I just – I'm not buying it. Butler at home, the fighting Thad Matas. I am Butler and taking... Georgetown back-to-back -back wins at home. Yep, same. Uh, G-Town, let's mark WW. All right, uh, Creighton. Creighton and UConn back-to-back -back losses on the road. What a tough stretch there. You go from Butler and brutal. Georgetown to then Tuesday to Sunday. At least it's not like a Wednesday and Saturday, but Tuesday and Sunday, Creighton and Connecticut back to back on the road. That is tough. That might be it the, is, is, but at least the, it's at least you have Georgetown at home right before it, and then St. John's at home right after it. So not not a death row slate. Yeah, uh, I am also going to go back to back L's there. So we are now. Whatever that is, we are still on the same page. St. John's at home. Rick Patino visits the Cintas Center on January 31st. Uh, another win. Sweep St. John's this year. Sean Miller sweeping Rick Patino. I'm agreeing with you, Rick. Look at this. As much as you and I have been hanging out together over the last month and a half, we're just on the same wavelength. All right. You know what? You can say yours first this time, so no one thinks you're just following my lead here. All right. Oh, that's bold. Given the next game is DePaul, I'm going to say that's a win. <laughs> I'm going to say that's a win as well. All right, uh, Villanova at home. I I'm I'm picking a loss here. I'm going I, loss I, loss. Villanova Creighton back to back at home. Tough two home losses. I 
where I didn't buy the Villanova stock last year with Justin Moore coming back and all this talent that Villanova has this year, I'm going to give the Wildcats some credit this year. I, I, I think, uh, I think they sweep Xavier this year and I'm going to take Creighton as I really want to pick. You know what? Screw it. I'm picking Xavier to beat Creighton at home. There. All right. Every, everybody happy there. Seton Hall on the road. That's a win for me. I'm, I'm going. Full, I'm a full fate of the pirate ship. I'm going win at Seton Hall and win at home against Providence. Okay. Same. Marquette on the road. That's a hard L. Definitely an L. Uh, DePaul at home. I'll just pencil that in. Unless, unless you no. W. Oh yeah, that is yeah yeah yeah. Okay. Georgetown on the road. Ed Cooley. W. Anything? Yep. Georgetown. Anything with Georgetown? Any notes? Any nuggets? I, anything in your head with Georgetown? I don't expect them to be any good. Yeah. Neither do I. And I, I'm not sure I've gotten a lot of optimism from anybody that I've talked to about this. This is going to be very much a tougher. rebuilding year. Like they won't be a team that's a, a complete disaster and a team that quits in the middle of the year or anything like that. They'll be tougher on a night to night basis. You won't have those blowout losses as much. I don't think, but I don't think they're a team that's going to win a lot of games. Yep. All right. Butler uh, on the road at Hinkle, March 6th. That's a Wednesday night. And that's a win for Xavier. Agreed. Okay, so we've only disagreed on one game. We're going into the last game. Senior night. Marquette at home. Do it. Loss. Oh, two games. I'll I'll give Xavier a win there. I think Xavier gets okay. it done at home. I think by that point in the season, I, I fully expect to be Marquette or to, for Marquette to be very good this year. I like that. I'm not at all out on Marquette this year. Uh, I know, obviously, the struggles Shaka Smart has had in the NCAA tournament. It is truly remarkable when you think about how much success Shaka has had at points like last year in the regular season and the fact that he hasn't really done anything in the NCAA tournament since that Final Four of VCU. I, I just, when you look it up and you think back to the fact that he is only, he, he hasn't been out of the first weekend since 2011 in that Final Four. I know. It, it, is, I mean, it is hard. That's to crazy. It is hard to believe. At the same time, I weirdly feel like I'm I'm like I'm back in on Shaka Smart though. I was out for a while and now I I, I really do believe in what he's doing at Marquette. Like that style they were playing last year, I think is fantastic. And I think you know the NCAA tournament is what it is, but the, I do think overall they'll win with that style of play. Yeah, I don't know if I was ever necessarily out. It's just tough looking at your resume and realizing you've been at VCU and had decent teams at VCU. You made the tournament. Then you go to Texas. You can't win there. And then, well, but his offense was so bad. I mean, his offense yeah. style of play was so bad. He's revamped everything. He got those guys. He got like that G league guy and a D three guy or whatever it was that were like offensive gurus. And they have completely, I mean, kind of similar to way Xavier's playing. A lot of it is playing faster on offense, getting more possessions. And then they really just create a lot of space on the offensive end and force you into a lot of long closeouts and uh, give their ball handlers space and opportunities to make plays off the bounce. And they, uh, yeah, they're, what he's doing now is way different from what he was doing offensively a handful of years ago. Okay. So to recap the schedule, and this is where every single year, if you listen to this, you know that this is where I always just shake my head because then I, I pick the games but I don't actually go back and do the math on the the, the record until the end, and then I realize you, you don't agree four, with it. Fourteen and six is just not happening. Like if last year's team that went to the Sweet Sixteen was fifteen and five, fourteen and six, and maybe the best Big East that we've seen in a decade, I, it's just that's not happening. You had twelve and eight, probably more realistic there. I didn't even mean to do that. What what was my final record then? So it would have been 11, something in 11. Dude, at 19 20 and 11. And, no, 20 and 11 I mean. we were 20 and 11. Yeah, 20 and 11. 20 and 11. And I would, I'd have been I, 22 and 9. I, w I must have got one over by your um, your positivity there at some point. I, I should have had probably another loss in the uh I'm happy to flip late. Yeah, where yeah, but, but where where are you picking the loss though? Like an at Seton Hall, if you're buying. Oh, that 
almost almost anywhere in, in conference. I mean, does it really matter? Like we've seen this team lose games to DePaul. It's you know, I mean, like in the big east, like any night yeah. you can slip up and lose one if you don't bring it. So at Butler. Yeah, I mean, it's not hard to find another loss on this schedule. I think if I were if I were making predi- my prediction, I would lower it by one game. I think they'll win 19 games total. I think they win. I think they get to 20. I think they get to 20 wins. Uh, I think they win. See, this is where it's tough because you lose out now on the first round of the Big East tournament. It, you have to be in the top five to get past Wednesday. And... To say they get back to Friday to win two games, mm, I, I don't know. I'll say that they, I'll say they go twenty and what would that be? Let's do public math here. Are you are you adding in postseason wins now? No, 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 no. Oh, regular okay. season, regular season. Tw- twenty and eleven then. Twenty, yeah, twenty. <clears throat> they go twenty and eleven. They will lose on Thursday in New York. And they'll make the NCAA tournament as a nine seed. Does that all? Does that all? Does that math add up? It could. I feel like. I don't know. Does Someone, that, Doug Tip will tell us if it doesn't. I mean, somebody's listening to this, going, "There's absolutely no way they're a nine seed if they go twenty and eleven. And, but yeah, that math. Yeah, I probably out. would maybe have a more like 10, 10 or eleven seed. They might be one of the last teams in at that point. But yeah, if they're making the tournament. That's your okay. overall point. There's you think they make the tournament. Uh I have them right on the bubble. I have them right on the bubble. I'll say I'll okay, I'll say that they find a way to play their way in. I think they are as bubbly of a team as you can get. Do they make it past Dayton? I guess is my question. The play in games? Day- uh yeah, Day- Dayton they they hang the banner if they go to Dayton, but do they get past Dayton? I think they yeah, I think they uh, make it past the play in games. I don't think they'll be one of the the play in games. Yeah. Okay. I agree. Same here. Um, anything around the big East to wrap this up to any, any thoughts on the big East? Obviously there's a lot of top end talent in this conference. You look at, uh, Yukon Marquette Creighton, uh, Villanova. There is, there what, is a very, so right there. So right there. That's my question. You, you mentioned Villanova last is Villanova. I feel like there are different tiers in the Big East this year. And to me, UConn, Marquette, and Creighton are clearly in the top tier. Is Villanova in that tier or is Villanova in the next tier? I'm gonna say that they I'm gonna say that they have their own. I, I think they are a one B to those three teams, but that okay. they but that are they are worse than Creighton and Marquette and Yukon. I, I, I don't I, I'm just not gonna totally buy in to it yet until i see it um you know i i I just want to see it from villanova this year with the full roster and resume and justin moore and everybody else okay so then my next tier if let's take villanova either in that tier or they're in their own tier in between then is the next tier xavier providence seton hall and st john's would you agree with that xavier providence seton hall st yes yep and then the bottom okay. would be Those the bottom three. is yep. Butler, DePaul, and Georgetown by themselves. Yep. That's I'd how agree. I see the tiers, tiers playing out. And those teams in the middle then, well, you know, you, you've got your top four will be NCAA tournament teams clearly. And then those next four will determine how many teams the conference gets conference gets in. It's like if all three of the or if three of those four teams can have incredible non-conference runs and uh you know handle their business in conference enough then I think it's possible you could see seven teams get in this year for the Big East. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think this is a very strong conference. I think there's a lot to be excited about. I think night in and night out, you're going to get your money's worth coming to games. And um, I think it's going to be a fun, fun year. I think just overall, my last thought would be to reiterate what I said a few minutes ago, where brace yourself for some learning curves and for some adjustments and for what's going to potentially happen in the beginning of this season. But Sean Miller has said over and over again, he said it on the podcast the other day, he has said it in media. He said it at media day. He's been all over the place saying that he expects that this team can make noise by the end of the season. It's just going to take a learning curve and to take some lumps to get to that point. I, I believe that um, 
it'll just be interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah, and I think part of the fun thing for fans within that is you can have an eye to the future with this year's team pretty easily. Like, yeah, yeah, you want them to win now, and yeah, I think they'll be competitive enough to make this year fun. But in the back of your mind, you're probably always thinking, like, as hard as it, it is to prepare for the future in an era with the transfer portal and guys leaving early for pros and, and I money and all that stuff, you've got a Trey Green, you've got a Lazar Djokovic, you've got a Dalen Swain, like Sasha Siani even. Those guys, if they're making impacts on this year's team, it's going to be really easy to dream on what next year looks like and, and the future beyond that. So I think that's part of the fun of this year for Xavier fans. And uh, Paul, I have to admit, I, I tweeted this out earlier, but when you posted that you're going to be launching some of the preview episodes for the rebound rundown this coming week, that legitimately got me fired up like that. <laughs> it, it, it's I, I think it's really cool when people can make a product and it either changes your behavioral patterns or it becomes part of your daily routine. And you didn't do the former last year, but you did do the latter. Like it became if I was walking the dog or if I was out uh, at whatever city NKU was playing in and doing a walk around the hotel, like that, I, I would listen to the podcast every day. And it just kind of gave me the feeling of at its basketball season. So the fact that you'll be back in our ear holes every single day is, uh, is good to good to know. Yeah. I wouldn't want it any other way. I, I'm very excited for it. I think, um, the teams that I cover are going to evolve a little bit this year, uh, but it'll still be, I, I really want to focus on like the NKU Xavier Cincinnati. Um, I'll have UK too waiting on it. Uh, I, I may, I may include Ohio state and Dayton. I'm, I'm still, still waiting to hear on, uh, I, I may, I may have to include them. Uh, we'll, we'll see depending on, uh, depending on some some sponsorship opportunities with with people that were uh, talking about you know where we uh, where we wanted to cover teams and things like that so Ohio State and Dayton um, may be included on this year's roster but uh, I wouldn't yeah I wouldn't I, mind getting some Ohio State coverage so you touch on the big Ten a little bit I that's that was exactly my point when we were talking about different just different markets that that the rebound rundown wanted to cover um, my pitch was you know if, if we can get another market in Columbus, uh, and Ohio State in another conference. Um, I, I wouldn't mind doing that and just being up on another conference too, uh, because that that's kind of what the what the show has come to be. And I, look, I love doing it. Between the Sean Miller show, another show that we're going to launch in a few weeks um, that I'm not going to give away right now, but another one that'll be pretty fun for people to listen to. Um, the rebound rundown, everything else. It, it, there will be plenty of content. Uh, not really sure when I'm going to sleep, but that's okay. We'll, 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 we'll sleep at the end of the season. And it'll be a lot of fun. And uh, look, Rick to you again, I, I just want to say thanks for uh, helping promote the show. I know you're going to be a very much a recurring guest on the rebound rundown this year. And uh, you are a massive help in the NKU preview, which is going to be a lot of fun for NKU fans to listen to. Um, I've, already recorded a lot of that and that is that was a very very good episode so thanks to you for that and uh, look this has been the season preview of the musketeer report podcast always one of the best shows of the year and well, let's have a year rick we're we're uh, six days away let's have a year let's have some fun uh, let's have a year uh, i'm ready so ju just to be clear sean miller podcast is up new you can get the first two episodes out yes. rebound rundown which will be a daily college basketball podcast focused on local teams will be coming within the next week or so and that'll be every day every weekday during college basketball season yep. and nothing's going to change here either that this that's not taking you away from this we're still going to try to do a weekly monday usually show here for musketeer report and uh also i don't want to speak for your rebound rundown show but i think i will typically be on the rebound rundown that same day yeah. as well so yeah uh, very yeah. similar to last year in that regard so not not a lot changing you're not losing anything from last year in terms of coverage with paul doing his new gig but there are a couple new really good things to check out there in terms of his content nothing's changed just more added just more work and uh wouldn't want it any other way this is the best time of the year it's a lot of fun and, and doing this and and you know too uh the last thing i would say is just being at practice, and I mentioned this on the last show that we did, but being at practice consistently, you know, there have been practices that I've popped in and out at, uh, the office hours that I would work at Xavier when I was a student five, six years ago, whereas I, I would try and schedule my office hours up in the press box during practice and during the Mac days when I could sit up there and maybe listen and catch a few tidbits or nuggets here and there. But I haven't been at practice consistently in probably six or seven years. And now being there over the last month and a half, it, you know what? 
I feel like it's contributed to a better show here. I hope it will contribute to a better show on uh, you know this, whatever I'm on over the next few months as we cover the season and uh, doing this, being with you, being with Adam and, 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 and giving this coverage and uh, I'm looking forward to it. I think this is going to be a really special year for Xavier fans to have some insight and access to the program that they haven't been able to get in a while. And I think this podcast is a major part of that, the, the Musketeer Report, I mean, and, and obviously everything else that we're starting and we're doing. So I uh, hope everybody appreciates it. And Rick, I'm really looking forward to everything that we're able to do uh, together this season, too. Likewise, plenty more to come. Glad it's here. And uh, we are literally just days away now from the 2023-2024 season tipping off. Let's do it, Paulie.